Hello everyone and welcome back. Now in the past two videos we have spoken about how to find series solutions to differential equations. Now what we're going to do in this video is sort of step back and think about the theory of this for a moment. And in particular we should ask ourselves how is it that I was even able to take a series solution? How was it that I knew that it would even exist or that I would converge at any values of x let alone a lot of them. Well, that's what we're going to focus on today. So let's remind ourselves that we were looking at differential equations that look like this. P of x, y double prime, plus Q of x, y prime, plus R of x, y is equal to zero. Okay, that's my second order differential equation. When I started off with two videos ago, I said, well, let's assume that P, Q, and R are polynomial. And I sort of use this to convince you, hopefully through some examples, that things are all good, right? Sometimes you might take me as the authority on this, and, and so if I tell you that it's gonna work, then it, it works. But unfortunately, math doesn't work that way, right? We need to justify our claims. And so what we're going to do, we should circle back and ask ourselves, you know, why exactly did this work? Why was I able to take a series solution? Well, let's look at this for a second. If this thing had a, we know it does have a solution, for example, near an ordinary point. So we use that piece uh, to guarantee that a solution does exist. Then I could, for example, try to expand this thing as a series, right? So again, I know a solution exists. Let me try and expand it near a point. Let me ask myself, does it work, right? So how do I find what the a n's actually are for this thing? Well, first of all, Taylor, or from Taylor series, we know this. So Taylor tells us that the mth derivative at x naught is equal to uh, m factorial divided by a m. Right, so sometimes, typically with the Taylor series, you see the, the m divided off here, uh, or the m factorial divided off. It doesn't really matter which way you want to write it, but the point is that as long as I can take some derivatives of my solution, I can always find what these coefficients are. So the question is, you know, how do we know when we actually have uh, derivatives to be taken? Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a little trick. I'm going to say put B into the ODE, okay? So here's what happens. I get P of X, phi double prime of X. Now this is gonna look really boring for a second, but bear with me. So I'm just gonna write out the differential equation. Phi of X is equal to zero. Let's rearrange for phi double prime. Remember, phi of x naught and phi prime of x naught are gonna be given to you because of this second order differential equation. So you're gonna center it around uh, a point where you have initial conditions. So that means that we would like to find the second derivative at x naught. So look at the, the differential equation. We can rearrange this thing to try and figure out what it should be. I'm gonna use little p of x to, de to denote q divided by p. I'll write that in a moment. And I'm going to use little q of x to denote r divided by p. So let me just re let me write that down so everybody can see it. Uh, this thing, so little p of x is equal to capital Q of x divided by capital P of x, and little q of x is equal to capital R of x divided by capital P of x. It's just what we do whenever we're trying to talk about unique solutions. Well then, let's take a look at this. At x equal to x naught, this gives us the second derivative of x naught is equal to minus p of x naught, phi prime of x naught. Phi prime of x naught is given, and then minus q of x naught, phi of x naught. Now, 
Why is it that an ordinary point was important? Well, again, we need to not divide by zero here, and we need to actually have these values for little p and little q, right? So assuming continuity, for example, is good, that gives us a unique solution, and then the ordinary point piece of this assumes that you know this p of x naught and this q of x naught actually exists. So in this case, this gives us 2 factorial times a2. Remember, we want to find all the a's in this case, and so we're using this equation right here. Well, if I put m equal to 2 in here, I get 2 factorial a2, and this is just this piece that I have written right above. So in theory so far, I can actually find what the second coefficient of this thing is. And what I want you to see here is that I haven't used anything more than what's given to me in the problem. I never had to solve it. These are given by initial conditions. These are given as part of the differential equation. So what I'm doing here is building the series without actually knowing what the solution is. That's a very important piece of this. Well, let's take this thing right here and let's differentiate it again. Okay, so that's going to give me phi triple prime of x. And then now I've got a, an ugly term to differentiate, but we can do it. I get p prime of x, phi prime of x, uh, plus p of x, phi double prime of x, and then plus q prime of x, phi of x, plus q of x, phi prime of x, okay? So it's just a, a bunch of product rules. But again, look at this. This is really, really interesting. I know this from the initial condition. I know this from the initial condition. I know this from the ODE. I can get that from the ODE. I, can, I got that in the previous step. I know this from the ODE, initial condition. I can get it from the ODE. So again, I've got a recurrence relation. This tells me that 3 factorial a3 is equal to phi triple prime of x naught. And I can get it from right here at x equal to x naught. So what's the purpose of all of this? This is telling me as long as I can get this information on the right, I can always build out this series. And so what is crucial here? Well, it's crucial that I have derivatives of p and q that I can take, and I still don't introduce any issues. So we can ask ourselves, is it the case that I just have to have that p and q are infinitely differentiable? Because clearly, if I would like to do this again, I'm just going to take another derivative, right? So this gives me m factorial am is equal to phi tri uh, to the nth derivative of x naught, which I can just find by taking more and more derivatives. So the question is, is it enough for p and q to be infinitely differentiable? Well, no. Let me give you an example of something that's very interesting in mathematics. If your function is infinitely differentiable, it does not need to have uh, a series solution, or it does not need to have a series. So let's look at this y double prime plus q of x y is equal to zero, where q of x is equal to, now here's what it's gonna look like, it's gonna be e to the minus one over x when x is positive, and it's gonna be zero when x is less than or equal to zero. This is an infinitely differentiable function. In particular, you can check, so check. Well, in this case, you're gonna get every single derivative of this thing at zero is equal to zero. Okay, so what does that actually tell us? Well, it tells us something very important. If you try and repeat this method, Here's what will happen to you. Then 
phi double prime of zero is equal to minus q of zero phi of zero, which is equal to zero because this is equal to zero. Uh, but then phi triple prime of zero is equal to minus q of zero times phi prime of zero, and then minus q prime of zero times phi of zero. Zero and zero. Okay, and you can keep doing this to find that every single derivative of your function must also be zero because you just keep getting derivatives of q evaluated at zero. If you try to get a series solution to this thing, you're going to get phi of x is equal to sum from n equal to zero to infinity a n uh, x to the n. But from all of our formulas for calculating the a n's, all of them are equal to zero except for the first two because the first two were free to be chosen. So that tells you that your solution to this differential equation is linear. But you can check. The solution to this thing is not linear. It's definitely not a linear function, and therefore, uh, this didn't work, right? So this is not going to work. So clearly, you need something a little bit more than being infinitely differentiable if you want to be able to find a series solution. And in particular, what you need is that p and q also have series. So you have. So we need. Here's what we need. P of x is equal to, well, its own sum. So we have a series solution to this thing. I'm going to call these Pn for its coefficients about x naught. And I'm also going to assume that Q of x is, has a series solution expansion, which will be Qn x minus x naught to the n, and I'm going to assume both converge for x minus x naught less than rho with some rho positive. So there is some region where these things actually converge on. Now, we refer to these kind of functions as analytic functions. So they are much more than infinitely differentiable, right? They have a power series representation. So we already saw that they have derivatives of every order. That's fine. This thing is also infinitely differentiable, but it doesn't have a series expansion at zero because its series expansion is just all zeros. What you need is you need to have a series expansion that converges at least for some values of x. That's the important piece. These types of functions, so this implies that p and q are analytic functions. It's a very, very particular kind of functions. It includes a lot of this, the, the functions that you are very aware of. So things like, um, things like Polynomials are analytic, sine and cosine are analytic, e to the x is analytic. A lot of the functions that you learn in calculus early on are analytic functions. They have infinite derivatives and they have power series. And calculus is designed to be like that because we explore topics like power series and derivatives. Now, let me, let me just jump back to the example for a second, right? So I offhandedly said, this thing doesn't have a power series. So let's say back to example. Example. Okay, well then Q of X equal to E to the minus one over X for X positive and zero for X less than or equal to zero. Well, what I just got was a series expansion here where Every single term is equal to zero. So I get zero times x to the n, which means that my series is just zero. It's kind of weird, right? It's saying that my Taylor expansion of this thing is just zero. There's no polynomials. But 
but q of x is positive uh, for all x positive, right? Every single positive value of x I put in there, I get a positive number. So the series does not converge. Does not converge for any x positive. Why? Because this is just zero, right? So it converges to zero. But if it's going to converge, it's going to converge to the value of the function, which is a positive number. So you're saying zero converges to something positive. Doesn't make sense. And this thing is a terrible, terrible function. It's an example of a function that is not analytic, but it has infinitely many derivatives. So Sometimes when people learn about analytic functions, they, they quickly associate them with being infinitely differentiable. They are infinitely differentiable, but they have so much more. And that so much more comes from the fact that they have these power series expansions, right? So this is a very, very strong property that we see in functions and that is not held by all infinitely differentiable functions. Again, my example right here, shows you that this thing has infinite derivatives right here, but it does not have a power series expansion at x equal to zero. Okay, so then what would it mean if p and q were analytic? Well, if p and q were analytic, then we could say something very important. So, we could actually put in, some, in a nice theorem here that I'm going to write very, very uh, sort of loosely, okay? So if P and Q are analytic, so let's say, uh, how sh what's a nice way to write this? Uh, so P and Q are analytic. Right, and so being analytic means that there exists a power series expansion uh, at x equal to zero at an ordinary point x equal to x zero. Well, this tells me that general solution to the ODE, so I'm trying to write this uh, very informally, but the general solution of this ordinary differential equation right up here, remember little p and little q are formed from capital P and capital Q and capital R and capital P. Then the general solution is y of x is equal to the sum of n equal to zero to infinity a n x minus x naught to the n. So you can always write it like that. And Remember from the previous two lectures, we saw that a0 and a1, they're always going to be free variables. And so what you can do is you can separate out these conditions in terms of a0 and a1 into two functions, y1 and y2. And both of those functions are analytic at x0 as well. So such that y1, y2 are analytic. at x equal to x zero too. And they also have the same radius of convergence, okay? So basically what we're seeing here is that properties of these little p and little q functions, they transfer over when you have an analytic or when these things are analytic, right? And in particular, if they both have a radius of convergence at least given by rho, then so does my solutions, y1 and y2.